So this is On the Phenomenon of Bullshit Jobs by David Graeber, same author as the last one. And this was the essay that he put out. It came out just a few years ago, anyway. Uh, probably shortly before this this was put out. So this this came out July 18th, 2018. Probably came out not too far uh, ahead of that. And this is just some of his, his musings on, on these jobs that he was starting to categorize as being completely superfluous to any sort of benefit to humanity. He, he turned this into a book, as, as I mentioned earlier, a really phenomenal book uh, called Bullshit Jobs. Uh, probably the, the, the best, like as I said earlier, the best book that I've, I've read this year so far. It's definitely the one that, that's come up again and again because it really, it really puts itself at odds with a lot of the, uh, the capitalist ideas that we grow up with and the capitalist myths that are just taken for granted uh, because maybe we hear them by, by some, uh, repeated by someone who we respect or who is in a, a, a revered field. Uh, maybe they just seep in without really ever being explicitly said. It's just something that, that we pick up on without it ever being said out loud. But either way, it, it really takes on a lot of these myths, and it, it gets at the heart of one of the biggest reasons why capitalism is just so nonsensical uh, and such a damaging way of organizing human society and, and, a, and a silly way of organizing human society, a way that, that hurts people for no good reason, and all for this, this idea that if you're not doing some co some kind of officially authorized work that you're not contributing so to society when so many of these jobs and he put the, he put the figure at over 50 percent of, of jobs in the u.s don't don't correspond to any sort of benefit to society and so, so on the one hand, you're being pushed to, to work, work, work. You know, you see that push right now with, with people being, with, uh, especially politicians and, and uh, pundits of every stripe, talking about how it's such a, a tragedy that, that people are being allowed to, to stay on unemployment, this, this generous unemployment that's come out because of COVID. And, you know, I say generous very loosely. It's, it's basically a minimum for, for a lot of people. But anyway... They, they're like, oh, they, they should be kicked off unemployment and, and you know, you, you know, hunger does, does wonders to get people back to work and stuff as, as, as though all the jobs that they would be going back to are necessary to perform. As though we couldn't do a lot better just continuing to give them those, that money or even more money, an actual livable wage, a livable stipend. And, and just do away with a lot of the jobs that, that they are currently doing or that are currently staying unfilled. But that, that, that's enough preface. Let, let's get into the essay that, that launched the book or that eventually was turned into the book. In collaboration with Audible Anarchist. On the phenomenon of bullshit <laughs> job. Uh, so, uh, Decve. I don't believe I've seen you before in the chat, so if you're interested in this sort of thing, go ahead and, and give a follow. Uh, you you asked, what, what is an anarchist? <laughs> we, we just got done with the essay, are you an anarchist? So, so perhaps when this VOD is done, you can go back and, and look at that. But just real briefly, an anarchist is someone that believes in things like uh, egalitarianism, fairness, a basic living standard for, for every human so that they can live their, their highest and best potential, an absence of unjust hierarchies, sort of hierarchies that, that, that tend to happen in an owner and worker relationship. We have an owner that, that, that makes all the decisions of a business and workers that, that have little to no say in, in the running and operation of that business and yet depend on it for their survival. Anarchists don't, are, are basically suspect of any sort of power that doesn't justify itself. It doesn't show why it is being... Uh, why it is necessary to have, and they believe in spreading out power and decision making as 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 much as possible, uh, to well well still keeping things functional and running, and uh, 
so a libertarian well in in the 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 truer sense of the word libertarian yeah for sure uh libertarian was co-opted by right libertarians uh, the so-called anarcho-capitalists which is a contradiction in terms of the united states so they they've muddled that phrase intentionally in order to to steal some of the uh i don't know the, the cachet or the clout of of actual libertarians left libertarians but i don't mean it that way at all i don't believe in, in having unlimited so-called business freedoms i think that only leads back to hierarchy and exploitation and a lot less freedom overall for people i would always trade uh the, the, the freedom of a business owner for the freedom of, of all the workers to live a good and, and um, worthwhile life. So I hope that helps a little bit. But let's continue on with uh, bullshit jobs. A Work Rant by David Graeber. In the year 1930, John Maynard Keynes predicted that by century's end, technology would have advanced sufficiently that countries like Great Britain or the United States would have achieved a 15-hour work week. There's every reason to believe he was right. In technological terms, we are quite capable of this, and yet it didn't happen. Instead, technology has been marshalled, if anything, to figure out ways to make us all work more. In order to achieve this, jobs have had to be created that are effectively pointless. Isn't it funny that no matter what job you're doing, Somehow, the labor required to do it always fits perfectly into a 40-hour work week or, or a part-time, um, several pieces of a 40-hour work week spread, about, spread amongst uh, more than one employee. Isn't that kind of weird? It doesn't matter if you're working in a cafe. It doesn't matter if you're working in, in, uh, in tech. It doesn't matter where you're working at all. Somehow, it always works out that it's a 40-hour work week and an eight-hour day, by and large. Now, now, I myself work for 10-hour days a week, but, but still, doesn't matter what job you do, the workflow is never that consistent, is it? I know it's not for landscaping. That's my primary job. There's a lot of times and, and a lot of parts of the season where there's a lot less work to do, and you just kind of gotta find work to go do. So you're not actually doing much of anything productive, per se, you, you may still pull a few weeds, but, but it's never as, as vital work as, as in the, the busier times. And there's times when there's, there's more work than can be handled all at once. Uh, we're coming up on, on fall cleanup pretty soon, and we're going to be doing, at the same time as fall cleanup, we're going to start switching out the, the uh, planter boxes for a lot of these, these places that we manage. It's going to be a lot of work all at once. It's going to be like an all-hands-on-deck, all this sort of thing. There's probably even going to be overtime. But the point being, it's kind of weird to, to think that, that every job somehow neatly fits into a 40-hour work week. So that should be a hint to you that maybe it doesn't, and that we've just come to this idea that, that unless you're putting in 40 hours, you're not being serious about it, or you're not being as productive as you could be. When that's been shown not to be the case. It's been shown that produ productivity for most, say, office jobs peaks after about six hours. And you don't get much out of a person after that point. They start thinking about their evening, you know, uh, or they, they, they come in and it takes them a while to get going in the morning. Six hours is about the limit. Uh, and it, it happens to be that between four and six hours tends to be a, about the amount of time that, that hunter-gatherer societies work in a given day to, to procure the, the food that they need for that day or for the, for the future. So, still. Just start thinking about that idea. That's my, my advice to you. Why is it an eight-hour day? Why is it a 40-hour week? Huge swaths of people in Europe and North America in particular spend their entire working lives performing tasks they secretly believe do not really need to be performed. The moral and spiritual damage that comes from this situation is profound. It is a scar across our collective soul, yet virtually nobody talks about it. Why did Keynes's promised utopia, still being eagerly awaited in the 60s, never materialize? The standard line today is that he didn't figure in the massive increase in consumerism. Given the choice between less hours and more toys and pleasure, we've collectively chosen the latter. 
This presents a nice morality tale, but even a moment's reflection shows it can't really be true. Yes, we have witnessed the creation of an endless variety of new jobs and industries since the 20s, but very few have anything to do with the production of distribution of sushi, iPhones, or fancy sneakers. So what are these new jobs precisely? A recent report comparing employment in the US between 1910 and 2000 gives us a clear picture, and I know one pretty much exactly echoed in the UK. Over the course of the last century, the number of workers employed as domestic servants in industry and in the farm sector has collapsed dramatically. At the same time, professional, managerial, clerical, sales and service workers have tripled, growing from one quarter to three quarters of total employment. In other words, productive jobs have, just as predicted, been largely automated away, even if you count industrial workers globally, including the toiling masses in India and China, such workers are still not nearly so large a percentage of the world population as they used to be. But rather than allowing a massive reduction of working hours to free the world's population to pursue their own projects, pleasures, visions, and ideas, we have seen the ballooning of not even so much of the service sector as of the administrative sector up to and including the creation of whole new industries like financial services or telemarketing, or the unprecedented expansion of sectors like corporate law, academic and health administration, human resources, and public relations. I was just talking with my wife today about health administration and, and the, the private industry uh, that is the, the public health sector in the United States. It tends to be one of the biggest employers in a given region. Uh, you have universities, you have Walmart, and then you have uh, healthcare, and and it it tends to be one of the big three in in any place that you you go to in terms of number of overall jobs that people do. And a lot of that has to do with just bureaucracy, uh, dealing with with. Uh, insurance companies trying to deny claims because the person was brought to the wrong hospital and that we're not in network or you know just dealing with all the massive amounts of paperwork that doesn't really need to be and you look at one you look at the reasons that that the US healthcare system is is so bloated and and we put so much more money into it per person than anyone else in the world any other country and yet don't get better results. In fact, we get worse results than, than a lot of other countries in the world. A big part of that is, is all of this private system and its inefficiency and waste. If it was instead put into a single payer system where the, the government, you have the same hospitals, you have the same doctors, you have all of that stuff, but there then is no in-network, out-of-network, there's no dealing with insurance companies. It's, it's all just the government pays for your health care right and well I'm, and really you put into that healthcare system through through your taxes however they would end up doing it the the amount of waste that would be eliminated would be just tremendous so it would cost a lot less overall to to run at the the same time though it would eliminate a hell of a lot of jobs and that's that's one of the reasons that uh, Barack Obama ended up shying away from a, a single payer system it's because he was afraid of, of how many jobs would be lost out of the, the healthcare industry. So, but it just shows how you know, there's one more myth of capitalism, the idea that, that private systems are always inherently more efficient and are going to produce more bang for your buck. It's, it's, it's not always the case. And here's a really good example of where it's not the case massively bloated industry that that is is by and large a private system uh where you know ha have you ever even really noticed the difference if you've ever had insurance at all have you noticed the difference that much between one provider or another or one hospital or another it's probably about all the same level of care and yet it's it, somehow the idea that the, the market's gonna you know, use its 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 power of competition and profit motive to to make things better. You'd think there would have been clear winners at this point, right? And 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 not all just a system that's about the same wherever you go. But it's not the case. Strange how capitalism doesn't work the way that it, it claims. 
And these numbers do not even reflect on all those people whose job it is to provide administrative, technical or security support for those industries. Or for that matter, the whole host of ancillary industries, dog washers, all night pizza delivery, that only exist because everyone else is spending so much of their time working in all the other ones. These are what I propose to call bullshit jobs. It's as if someone were out there making up pointless jobs just for the sake of keeping us working. And here precisely lies the mystery. In capitalism, this is precisely what is not supposed to happen. Sure, in the old inefficient socialist states like the Soviet Union, where employment was considered both a right and a sacred duty, the system made up as many jobs as they had to. This is why in Soviet department stores it took three clerks to sell a piece of meat. But, of course, this is the sort of problem market competition is supposed to fix. According to economic theory, at least, the last thing a profit-seeking firm is going to do is shell out money to workers they don't really need to employ. Still, somehow, it happens. While corporations may engage in ruthless downsizing, the layoffs and speedups invariably fall on that class of people who are actually making, moving, fixing, and maintaining things. Through some strange alchemy no one can quite explain, the number of salaried paper pushers ultimately seems to expand, and more and more employees find themselves not unlike Soviet workers, actually working 40 or even 50 hour weeks on paper, but effectively working 15 hours just as Keynes predicted since the rest of their time is spent organising or attending motivational seminars, updating their Facebook profiles or downloading TV box sets. The answer clearly isn't economic. It's moral and political. The ruling class has figured out that a happy and productive population with free time on their hands is a mortal danger. Think of what started to happen when this even began to be approximate. I think there's a lot of truth in that statement. Think about what people do, uh, say for... Uh... A, a job that that traditionally has been more prone to union unionization. If factory workers had extra time to to get together and and talk with people outside of work, they would be more likely to be able to unionize. Look at what happened with with Walmart just over uh, this summer, where they were going out of their way to make sure that their employees uh, at at that that uh, distribution center in. Uh, or was a f fulfillment center. Either way, their, their, their office or their warehouse in uh, Alabama it was Bessemer, I believe. Uh, so they, they they went out of their way to make sure that that employees of that facility left the premises as quickly as possible, to the point of convincing the local city to change the timing of the the lights at the front gate. So that they would have more greens per per hour than than reds. So there wouldn't be any time for them to stop just on the other side of, of the corporate property line and be able to be handed a leaflet by uh, by a union organizer, or you know the 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 lengths they went to, to to make sure that they didn't interact with one another. The amount of of meetings they had to to. Uh, take time away from their job to show them uh, videos that were, were anti-unionization. The amount of money they put into to destroying that is, is, is really telling. But that's, that's getting away from the point. The point being that when people have time to think, when they, when, when they have time to talk with one another and, and gather, they're more likely to want to do things like unionize or just individually say, hey, how much do you make? Oh, you make a lot more than me. I think I'm going to go talk to our, our boss and, and see what's what's up, why, why I'm getting the shaft here. So, yeah, I, I think there's, you know, people decry TV, uh, especially the rise of, of things like, uh, you know, just... just junk food TV, the, these, these, these artificially created drama shows, the, all these reality shows where people have a competition and, uh, you know, it's, it's very surfacey. It's a little bit of, of drama to, to, you know, make your neurons fire in a way that, that, that keeps you a little bit happy and engaged, but there's not a whole lot of substance to it. People decry that sort of thing, but I think there's a real big reason that that sort of TV is consumed more than any other. And that's that, people are being asked to, to contribute so much of, of their, their 
body and their brain to do their work, that by the time they get off work, uh, there's just nothing left. They, they, they're, they're not really capable of engaging in, in you know, high-level ideas uh, just because they're, they're, just reco- they're in recovery mode. They're, they're just trying to recover from the day and prepare for the next day. And, and that's about all they have time and energy to do. So I think that's a, a, probably the biggest reason that those sorts of shows are so prevalent and, and so well-liked and watched. And it just it shows what he's saying that 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 it's probably by design that they don't want you, you know, having the ability and the and the time and the and the means to get together with anybody else, especially people that you work with, because there's always the danger that someone will bring up a union, or, you know, talk about getting a better opportunity or whatever. So I think I think that's, there's a lot of truth in, in what he just said there. Made in the 60s. And on the other hand, the feeling that work is a moral value in itself, and that anyone not willing to submit themselves to some kind of intense work discipline for the most of their waking hours deserves nothing, is extraordinarily convenient for them. Once, when contemplating the apparent endless growth of administrative responsibilities in British academic departments, I came up with one possible vision of hell. Hell is a collection of individuals who are spending the bulk of their time working on a task they don't like and are not especially good at. Say they were hired because they were excellent cabinet makers, and then discover they are expected to spend a great deal of their time frying fish. Neither does the task really need to be done, at least. There's only a very limited number of fish that need to be fried, yet somehow they all become so obsessed with resentment at the thought that some of their co-workers might be spending more time making cabinets and not doing their fair share of fish frying responsibilities. There's that, there's that resentment component that comes in. This also could be by design, keeping employees focused on... Uh, hating one another or hating people that are, are, are doing jobs that they consider to be more uh, more of a contribution to to um, the world you know this this keeps the focus downward basically rather than upward to the real source of, of their problems and the real source of control over their lives that before long there's endless piles of useless badly cooked fish piling up all over the workshop and it's all that anyone really does. I think this is actually a pretty accurate description of the moral dynamics of our economy. Now, I realize any such argument is going to run into immediate objections. Who are you to say what jobs are really necessary? What's necessary anyway? You're an anthropology professor. What's the need for that? And indeed, a lot of tabloid readers would take the existence of my job as the very definition of wasteful social expenditure. And on one level, this is obviously true. There can be no objective measure of social value. I would not presume to tell someone who is convinced they are making a meaningful contribution to the world that really they are not. But what about those people who are themselves convinced their jobs are meaningless? Not long ago, I got back in touch with a school friend who I hadn't seen since I was 12. I was amazed to discover that in the interim, he had become first a poet, then the frontman of an indie rock band. I'd heard some of his songs on the radio, having no idea the singer was someone I actually knew. He was obviously brilliant, innovative, and his work had unquestionably brightened and improved the lives of people all over the world. Yet, after a couple of unsuccessful albums, he'd lost his contract, and, plagued with debts and a newborn daughter, ended up, as he put it, taking the default choice of so many directionless folk. Law school. Now he... Isn't that interesting that 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 tends to be... The choice that people think they have to make either you do something that you love that's that's your your uh your passion project your, your thing that you do just out of it bringing joy to yourselves and, and hopefully to the people that are are benefited from it uh or you have to to make the the tougher choice and and get a job that you hate but hey at least it pays the bill it's so strange that things are, are, are seen that way that you have to do one or the other and that one thing is is more moral and, and and responsible and the other thing is is frivolous even though the latter is is less likely to have a real impact on the world and the former the thing that you love doing 
is more likely to have an impact, a positive impact on the world. Strange how things are, are conceived of in society. He's a corporate lawyer working in a prominent New York firm. He was the first to admit that his job was utterly meaningless, contributed nothing to the world, and in his own estimation, should not really exist. There's a lot of questions one could ask here, starting with, what does it say about our society that it seems to generate an extremely limited demand for talented poet musicians, but an apparently infinite demand for specialists in corporate law? Answer, if 1% of the population controls most of the disposable wealth, what we call the market reflects what they think is useful or important, not anybody else. But even more, it shows that most people in these jobs are ultimately aware of it, in fact, I'm not sure I've ever met a corporate lawyer who didn't think their job was bullshit. The same goes for almost all the new industries outlined above. There is a whole class of salaried professionals that, should you meet them at parties and admit that you do something that might be considered interesting, an anthropologist for example, will want to avoid even discussing their line of work entirely, one or the other. Give them a few drinks and they will launch into tirades about how pointless and stupid their job really is. This is a profound psychological violence here. How can one even begin to speak of dignity in labour when one secretly feels one job shouldn't exist? How can it not create a sense of deep rage and resentment? Yet it is the peculiar genius of our society that its rulers have figured out a way, as in the case of the fish fries, to ensure that rage is directed precisely against those who actually do get to do the meaningful work. For instance, in our society there seems a general rule that the more obviously one's work benefits one other people, the less one is likely to be paid for it. Again, an objective measure is hard to find, but one easy way to get a sense is to ask, what would happen were this entire class of people to simply disappear? Say what you like about nurses, garbage collectors or mechanics, it's obvious that were they to vanish in a puff of smoke, the results would be immediate and catastrophic. A world without teachers or dock workers would soon be in trouble, and even one without science fiction writers or ska musicians would clearly be a lesser place. It's not entirely clear how humanity would suffer were all private equity CEOs, lobbyists, PR researchers, actuaries, telemarketers, bailiffs, or legal consultants to similarly vanish. Many suspect it might markedly improve. Yet apart from a handful of well-touted exceptions, doctors, the rule holds surprisingly well. Even more perverse, there seems to be a broad sense that this is the way things should be. This is one of the secret strengths of right-wing populism. You can see it when tabloids whip up resentment against tube workers for paralysing London during contract disputes. The very fact that tube workers can paralyse London shows their work is act. That's supposed to be tube workers, if you're following along with the closed captioning. Uh, it's, it's not perfect, but that's an important distinction. He's talking about the London Underground, the subway system the tube. Not, not two workers or those workers, whatever. ...actually necessary, but this seems to be precisely what annoys people. It's even clearer in the US where Republicans have had a remarkable success mobilizing resentment against school teachers or auto workers and not significantly against the school administration. Right? Like, like how often do you see them railing against nurses strikes, teachers strikes, all these people that, that they clearly do important things for the world and, and yet they're they're just without it i mean they're, they're being painted as, as just the the most ungrateful people ever it's a very strange phenomenon isn't it uh you know if if say um well, i don't know i can't think of a good uh, example but if if some job that that no one really thought was was all that important were, were to go on strike would they have the same venom for those people i i, I probably don't think they would because uh, they, they, there would be nothing about gratitude that they would be able to throw at them, be grateful to have any sort of job. No, it's it's kind of strange. I think I, hopefully he'll go into his explanation for this. Administrators or auto industry managers who actually cause the problems for their supposedly bloated wages and benefits. It's as if they are being told, but you get to teach children or make cars. You get to have real jobs. And on top of that, you have to have the nerve to also expect middle-class pensions and healthcare. If someone has designed a work regime perfectly suited to maintaining the power of finance capital, it's hard to see how they could have done a better job. Real productive workers are relentlessly squeezed and exploited. 
The remainder are divided between a terrorized stratum of the universally reviled, unemployed, and a larger stratum who are basically paid to do nothing, in positions designed to make them identify with the perspectives and sensibilities of the ruling class, managers, administrators, etc., and particularly its financial avatars, but at the same time foster a simmering resentment against anyone whose work has clear and undeniable social value. Clearly, the system was never consciously designed. It emerged from almost a century of trial and error. But it is the only explanation for why, despite our technological capacities, we are not all working three to four hour days. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube. As well as they, they put out a podcast of all the same stuff. Really great thing. You can find it uh, pretty much wherever fine podcasts are distributed. Uh, and that's also where you can find this stream as a podcast. Uh, it goes out to pretty much all the big ones, except I'm not on Stitcher yet. I, I'd like to be, but I've been having trouble uh, verifying an email address with them. So it just hasn't worked out yet. But it's on Google Podcasts. It's on... Um, I can never remember if it's Apple Podcasts or the iTunes Store, however they, however they uh, label themselves, but Apple basically. Uh, it's on uh, a whole bunch of different stuff. In fact, we can look at it right now. I will show you where you can find my podcast. So here's my link tree, the one that that keeps flashing uh, through Nightbot in the the um, in the chat there. You can always go to Pod News if you can't find a podcast. You go to Pod News and you, you type in the one that you would like to, to find. So bread underscore theory. There it is. And you search for it. And it will tell you all the different places that you can find that particular podcast. It's a really great service to have. And just automatically collects all this information. So yeah, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify as well as all these different ones, CastBox, Overcast Web, Player FM, uh, stuff I haven't really even heard of. Uh, I guess I've heard of Podfiend, but not Podstation, Podverse, I don't know, but I'm, I'm on those places too. Uh, it just automatically goes out to those places through my RSS feed, uh, so you can find them in pretty much almost any place that you might have a podcast player that you like. And, and I will work even harder on getting it out to, to even more platforms. Uh, so that way, if you, if you miss any part of the stream and you happen to be able to listen to stuff at work, but perhaps not be able to look at YouTube videos or whatever, this is another way you can consume this content and you know be a part of, of what goes on here. Uh, so yeah, uh, um, Bullshit Jobs, a very fantastic book. Highly recommend it. You can get it, I believe, on Red Emma's, which is a leftist bookstore. Uh, Red Emma's. So an independent bookseller as well as a cafe. Worker owned and operated. So you don't have to feel bad as, as if you had gotten it from... Uh, there we go. I already, I've searched for it before. So you don't have to feel bad... Uh, as you would getting it from like Amazon or whatever. It's a way to, to support a worker-owned cooperative. There it is. 18 bucks. Not a bad deal. Uh, I do know that the, the audiobook is available on Amazon's Audible service. And, and that I wish I knew had another source for. But that's the only place I know of it now in its, its full form. But I can't recommend the book enough. Really, it's it's he's got a wonderful sense of humor, so he really keeps things moving along, and at the same time, he's he's throwing a lot of ideas and and uh, knowledge at you at the same time. He's got another great one called uh, "Debt: The First Five Thousand Years," which I have yet to read. I really want that's definitely on my reading list. Um, but that, that's another great one of his. But yeah, really cool anarchist thinker, David Graeber. And since we're getting up to the 9 o'clock hour, I think I'm probably just going to shut it down for the night. Uh, this would be a good place to stop if you want to continue along yourself, though. So thank you all for, for joining me tonight. I, I really appreciate it. anyone, everyone who's, who's tuned in. I hope you had a good time and, and maybe 
learn something, think, uh, uh, were able to think about something from a different perspective. Uh, yeah, I, I hope you are getting some some value out of this, and I hope to see you again in in future podcast or future streams as well, including this upcoming Sunday. I probably be going on with my permaculture series, and I think I'm I'm gonna have Dan Platt, who's joined me several times now on on the stream. Uh, he's a he's a really cool leftist organizer. Works a lot with the Green Party out in New York State, and uh, knows a bit about permaculture as well. So I think I'm gonna have him join me. He just had contacted me earlier today, wanting to know if he could get on the the, the stream again. So I think we'll we'll do that together. It'll be a, a good time learning more about permaculture so if that's something that you're interested in and if you're not in you're not, you're not uh familiar with permaculture at all it's it's a design system that is based on the ethics of uh care for the earth care for people and return the surplus to the service of the first two so basically mutual aid in my estimation as well as a number of principles things like produce no waste design from the patterns to the details, uh, use and value diversity, integrate rather than segregate, uh, observe and interact, and and uh, all these sorts of things, as, as well as a few more principles. Uh, and it's, it's most often applied to food system designs, so it's hard to even call it farming because it, it's more like large-scale gardening. Uh, you don't use hardly any equipment you may use it to set up the farm like do uh, earthworks to make the water flow in a way that you would prefer something like that or to, to build your house stuff like that but once once things are set up the idea is that you are more and more hands-off in this this sort of a system and it continues to grow in abundance where, where you're basically co-creators of an ecosystem around you that, that benefits all of the players that, that are involved, including yourself. You get a yield from it. Obtain a yield is, is one of the, the permaculture principles. But it can be applied to anything, including leftist organizing and philosophy. So, so that's my main reason for, for trying to delve more into that, get people up to speed on, on some of the concepts within it too, to see how they can apply it to their organizing and their conception of a, a better world, which I hope is what we're all doing. I hope we all want to, to move the world to a better place. Uh, otherwise, what's, I mean, really, what's the point of anything if we don't want things to be better? But yeah, again, thank you for joining me. And I'm going to go ahead and raid into someone else now. We will do non-compete. I, I like them. For some reason or another, a very controversial figure on Twitch and, and YouTube. But I've never heard anything bad out of, of EJ, or as well as his wife, Luna Oi. So I don't, I don't really know what the fuss is about. I don't know why people have, have such a hatred for them. I think they have good ideas, and they, they try to live uh, life as best they can. Lectem friends, or Lectem, I should say. And I will see you hopefully this Sunday for the Permaculture Stream.